which said that the whole point of deficit reduction, as it was put, was to keep the confidence of credit rating agencies. It was him who said that having a AAA rating was confidence, showed confidence of experts across the world in the policies that he was doing. On his terms, austerity is an abject and catastrophic failure, even its own rationale. But that isn't the point. Because when we're talking about what austerity is actually doing, it's not something which is simply trying to fix a problem the wrong way. It has two aims. Firstly, to make working people, the unemployed, disabled people, poor people pay for a crisis they had absolutely nothing to do with. And it is also an opportunity to do things which this Tory party always wanted to do, but never thought they could otherwise get away with. Now, I'll give you a few examples. Uh, and it's great to hear, to, to have on this uh, represented the campaign to defend the Whittington Hospital, which I spoke at a couple of weeks ago. The NHS, the privatisation of our National Health Service, which they didn't even have the guts to put to the British people. Now, the reason they didn't, as a Tory Nigel Lawson put in the 1980s, the NHS is the closest the British have to a religion, he said. They didn't have the guts to put that to the electorate. Whether it be the assault on education, the tripling of tuition fees, the scrapping of the educational maintenance allowance, whether it be the attack <coughs> on what the mainly rights working people have in this country, they hired a uh, private equity asset stripper, Adrian Beecroft, a multi-million pound donor to the Conservatives to draw up a charter stripping what remaining rights workers have in this country. These are all things that Tories would always have wanted to do. And as Greg Barker, a Tory minister, said a couple of years ago, these are cuts Thatcher could only have dreamt of. But I want to talk particularly about one aspect, one aspect alone of what this government is doing, which actually is firstly destroying the lives of millions of people, but is an example of a policy which they always wanted to do, and that is the assault on the welfare state. Now, what we have seen under this government, ever since it came to power, is a systematic campaign of demonisation and attempt to redirect people's entirely justifiable anger at the fact they're getting poorer year on year from the people at the top who cause this crisis to people's neighbours down the streets, the working poor against the unemployed, non-disabled people against disabled people, private sector workers against public sector workers. And each time they're saying the same thing. You've been mugged and therefore your less deserving neighbour should be mugged as well. Now what they have done as part of this campaign is to try and seek out the most extreme and unrepresentative examples to pass it off as though it's the tip of the iceberg. The latest they've added to that is a woman called Heather Frost who has 11 kids and apparently a horse. Now I wrote a piece about this for the Sunday People. Now, I won't go into detail about Heather Frost because that is all we've heard about for the last two weeks. Uh, I won't go into the details about the fact they had a dad in work who left them, about the fact the daughter herself is paying for this bloody horse, which will probably end up in a burger at some point anyway. <laughs> This is a family again passed off as though it's the tip of the iceberg. Now there are 1.35 million households in this country in which at least one adult claims our work benefits. So how many families are of above 10 there are in the, in, of those people in this country? It's not half a million, it's not 200,000, it's not 50,000, it's not 1,000, it's 190. And I think by now, each and every one have had their own reality TV show or double page spread in the tabloid newspapers. They are hunted down to show as though they are the tip of the iceberg. The reality instead is all but airbrushed out of existence. Like the fact Costa Coffee opened a branch in Nottingham with eight new jobs advertised. Do you know how many people applied for those eight new jobs? 1,700 people applied for eight minimum wage jobs in Nottingham. Now, Another example, the Josie Roundtree Foundation, they revealed a few weeks ago that for every single job in retail and supermarkets and shops, 66 young people are applying for each and every single vacancy. Most aren't even hearing back, as it turns out, when they send in their CVs. That is the desperation we have out there, and it is all but airbrushed out of existence in favour of the most extreme 
An unrepresentative scroungers dribbling on couches in mansions made out of widescreen television sets. Now all of this is a political, has a political objective, and that is to support the all-out assaults on our welfare state. Now I'll give you a few examples of those policies, and one, I think, if there's anything you remember in the next two years of this government, it is this. It is the cap they have put on in-work and out-of-work benefits, 1%, which in real terms is a huge cut for people who are struggling to make ends meet. And bear in mind, if you take the, the reality of what people are already facing, Save the Children uh, did a study a few months ago. They talked to parents and children across the country, and they found the world, the political and media establishment, have no interest in of people choosing between whether or not they have to feed their homes or feed their kids, of parents who are going literally with skipping a meal in order to make sure their sons and daughters are, aren't going hungry. That's already the situation. But we have this debate in Parliament with jeering, sneering, laughing Tory MPs who voted for a policy which for the first time since 1931 will mean the incomes of the poor will fall as a deliberate act of government policy. Now, the, the whole point of this debate, this bill they passed, the uprating bill, was part of this poisonous uh, language which we've been fed on a daily basis under this government. Strivers versus skivers, the feckless and the work shy hiding behind curtains in Cameron's Britain. <coughs> in reality, we know 60% of those affected are people who are actually in work. The rest are people who are desperately looking for work which doesn't actually exist. And what's worse is they try to justify this on the basis that benefits have been rising faster than earnings. Now actually, if you go back over the last 15 years, it's not true. It's only true in the last few years because bosses haven't been paying, have literally in real terms been cutting workers' wages. But in fact, in any case, these are two different groups of people. What is happening with the slashing of tax credits is first these people are having their wages cut, and then their tax credits are also being cut on top of it. First, you're mugged by your bosses, and then you're mugged by the Tories. That is the reality of what that policy is doing to people across the country. Another example, the bedroom tax, which I'm sure many of you have actually been more angry about than almost anything this government has done since it came to power. Now, this bedroom tax, which will affect 670,000 households right across Britain, which will mean that people who have a so-called spare room will lose up to £80 a month, and these are the poorest households in Britain. These are households, for example, uh, foster parents. Two-thirds of the people affected have someone who are disabled. It will affect the mothers and fathers of people who have been sent often to fight unjust wars. In Afghanistan, for example, if they vacate that room on tour for more than 13 weeks, then their parents will be expected to pay this bedroom tax. It will affect people, for example, who have just divorced and have a room for their kids to stay over. It will affect people who have a carer who stay over. Now, they say to these people, go out and downsize. Now, there aren't any properties for these people to downsize to. There aren't. There's a huge shortage of one-bedroom properties right across this country. There's nowhere to put people. And the reality is... What they're trying to do with this policy, again, is to get people to blame their neighbours. There's massive overcrowding in this country. We don't have social housing, council housing, because governments didn't build it. And instead, people are expected to go, I'm overcrowded, I'll blame my neighbour, who's got a so-called spare room instead. But this is a policy which will drive people into misery and poverty, and will drive up homelessness as people will no longer be able to afford their rents. At the same time, because of the slashing of council tax benefit, low-paid workers and unemployed people will be expected to pay council tax for the first time. Now, I want to give you an example of some of the people who got in touch with me about this. Someone, Wayne uh, Blackburn in Lancashire, he said, financially, this will cripple me and my wife. Zoe Edwards, who lives in Wandsworth, she's on a zero-hour contract, her kids just left home. Uh, she will have to pay this tax. Someone whose best friend is now dying of cancer, he is expected to pay this tax. Uh, a foster parent who's looking after a child will have to pay this tax. A man who moved in with his dying mother, now she has died, he has a spare room, he will pay this tax. Now I just want to end on this. We often, I think, in terms of this whole debate on welfare, 
We often are accused of not having a response. So I'm going to give quickly a coherent alternative to what they are doing. They say welfare spending is too high. Well, actually, it might sound a bit odd coming from me. They've got a point. Not because of a bunch of lazy scroungers. Because of three things. A housing crisis, a low wages crisis, and a jobs crisis. Now, £23 billion pounds of taxpayers' money is being wasted on housing benefit each year. People are right to be angry about that. That's not going in the pockets of the tenants. It's lining the pockets of wealthy landlords charging extortionate rents. <laughs> so let's control our rents, build council housing, create jobs, stimulate the economy, bring down the 5 million strong social housing waiting list. Also, it'll bring down the housing benefit bill too, which has gone up by 2 billion under this government. Tax credits, they're a lifeline for millions of workers. But let's be clear, they're a subsidy for low pay because bosses aren't paying their workers properly. If we had a living wage in this country, we wouldn't be spending billions on tax credits or housing benefit because 93% of new claimants to housing benefit are people in work. We'd bring down the welfare be bill too, and the same with the, with the jobs crisis. Keane said in the 30s, if you look after the jobs crisis, the deficit will sort itself out. That is a response, an alternative, to bring down welfare spending. And I want to end with this. I often go around the country and I speak to people, often getting a kick in under this government. And what upsets me more than anything else isn't the struggle and the anguish that are being imposed upon them. It's often a sense of resignation. It's a sense of there being no hope. There is no alternative which has been drummed into people's head, not just under this government, but for years before that too. We have to fight back, and one initiative I will be supporting is the People's Assembly, which has been brought together by trade unions, community groups and others. It will be meeting on June the 22nd in Westminster Hall, and right across the country we will be having meetings to build support. <coughs> that is an example of linking our campaigns and struggles together. Getting off our knees and fighting back, realising that there is an alternative. We don't have to be a member of the biggest party in this country, which is the ranting at the TV party. We can actually fight back. We stand together, we fight together, and we will win together.